Hi everyone. I'm Shubham Chandak from Stanford and I welcome you all to my presentation of our work on error correction coding for DNS storage. So let's get started. So don't worry about the title, but uh, we will go through all these terminology uh, terms um, through, uh, in our talk. Um, so first of all, uh, this is a joint work with uh, our collaborators from Stanford Electrical Engineering and from Stanford Genome Center. Uh, we would also like to thank all the funding agencies which made this work possible. Right, so let's get started. So, so what is the motivation, right? So, so this work focuses on something called DNA storage, which is, uh, which means using DNA as a storage medium. So instead of using, let's say hard disk or a solid state drive, can we use DNA as a medium for storage of data? Right. So, so let's say you have 200 petabytes of data. So if you were to store them using the standard hard disk drives, it would take you a truckload of hard disks and it would just last you for maybe a few decades. On the other hand, the DNA is so dense that you can store this 200 petabyte information in one gram of DNA. And if stored properly, it can last for thousands of years. Uh, furthermore, DNA offers very easy duplication using techniques we have borrowed from biology. So overall, it suggests that DNA can be a very, very nice storage medium, especially for archival storage. And in fact, all of, the, all of, all of life uses DNA as a storage medium for transmitting information from one generation to another. So, so let's see whether we can store data in DNA, uh, even our artificial data, right? So for that, let's look at the general setup. So for any storage medium, you need two important components. One is a way to synthesize data, basically write data into the medium, and then another way to uh, read the data back from the medium. So, so for synthesis or writing, we have the ability to write artificial DNA into uh, sequences of DNA bases. So, so just to make it completely clear, clear, DNA is a sequence of bases or nucleotides where each base or nucleotide can take four possible values, A, C, G, or T. Right? So it's just a string of alphabet size four, essentially. And currently we have the ability to synthesize a large number of uh, short sequences, maybe 150 uh, in length. And the synthesis per process is not perfect, but it's quite good. It's around 1% error rate, right? We also have the ability to read back DNA from the, uh, read back DNA from the solution. And this can be done using something called nanopore sequencing, which is, which consists of these very small devices around the size of a thumb drive, um, which provide portable way of reading back DNA and which also works in real time. So as soon as you start sequencing, you start getting the data on your computer, which is really nice for a storage application. So with this in mind, let's look at a general system which shows how a typical DNA storage system works. So you start with a file, uh, just a binary file. So as we said, we have the ability to synthesize short DNA sequences. So therefore you first need to segment this data into small parts, right? But now, if you think about it, when you put this data into the solution, you lose the ordering of the data, right? Because these segments, you, you, when you read them back, you can't read them back in the same order you wrote them. So therefore you need to add some, some sort of indexing. So you just write one, two, three, four to the sequences so that you can recognize which one is which one uh, when you read it back, right? You also need to apply some sort of in, uh, outer coding and inner coding, which are forms of error correction coding, which we will come to very soon. So stay tuned for that. After we have done this encoding, so these are DNA strands, DNA sequences, and then we synthesize them and we get some sort of solution or powder and we store it for some time. Uh, and then when we want to read it back, we do something called sequencing, uh, which as we saw before. And sequencing is usually followed by something called base calling. So, so sequencing means that you read back the data into some sort of raw format and then you try to base call it, that is convert it into a sequence of ACGT, right? And that gives you something called sequenced reads. So these are just sequences of ACGTs, which are supposed to be approximations of what we actually sent for synthesis. Unfortunately, this is not exact. There are several things that happen. One of the things is just due to the fact that these are in the solution. You have a lot of duplication of things. You might have these permuted as we talked before, for which we added the index. 
due to the random sampling process, you might just miss some of these sequences and just not get any copy of these. And finally, due to the errors involved in the synthesis, sequencing, base calling, all these processes, you have a lot of corruption. So if, if you synthesize some particular sequence here, maybe when you read it back, you get maybe some substitutions in some places. Maybe some bases are missing, they are deleted. Some base, extra bases are inserted. So lots of things can happen. And for that, we need these error correction codes, right? So, so first we look at the inner code. So what the inner code does is it allows us to recover from these corruptions. So within every re read, you apply some sort of inner code, some sort of extra parity bits, some sort of redundancy that allows you to recover back the original string from this distorted string, a corrupted string. And once you do that, you use the outer code, which allows you to recover from the loss of sequences. So for example, I had these four segments. I added two extra segments here. And now even if I miss two of the sequences while reading, I can still get back my original four sequences. So that's the idea of outer coding. So throughout this work, we will be focused more on the inner code and the outer code. We will just use some standard methods. Right? And overall, this allows you to decode back the original file, which is our aim. Right? So there are a lot of challenges, especially with nanopore sequencing. The error rates are really high, so 5 to 10%. And they are insertion and deletion errors mostly, which, which makes it very, very difficult because there is a lack of good error correction codes for this setting, especially considering that we have very short sequences. So you can't use large block codes. So how do people solve this? Most of the previous works just do something called consensus, which means that you read the sequence a lot of times. Uh, so, so because there is something called amplification, which goes on. So actually you can read the read independent copies of the sequence many, many times. Uh, and then you can cluster the sequences according to their index and then perform some sort of averaging, which allows you to reduce the, reduce the error. And then your inner code can potentially handle this. But this is very inefficient. This is similar to something called repetition coding, which we know is not the best way to do things. Um, and so let's look at the uh, results for the previous works. So we look at two aspects. One is the writing cost, which just means how many bases you need to synthesize per bit of information you want to encode. So if you use a lot of error correction, the writing cost basically goes up, right? The reading cost tells you how much do you need to read, how many bases, how many nucleotides you need to read to recover back one bit of information. And as we saw before, as we, as we discussed before, the reading cost is really high. You need maybe 20 bases to recover just one bit of information. And, the, uh, and there is a trade-off between these two quantities because if you add more error correction and more clever error correction, then it is possible that maybe you need to read much less to be able to recover the data. And ideally we want to be at the sweet spot of the trade-off where both the reading cost and the writing cost are relatively low. So let's look at how we do this. So first we need to understand a bit more on the nanopore sequencing itself. So the nanopore sequencing consists, as the name suggests, of a pore. Uh, the DNA passes through the pore. And as the DNA passes through the pore, some sort of current going through the pore changes. And that is recorded. And as you can see, the current actually depends on the number of bases inside the pore. So it's, it, it doesn't just depend on one single base. It depends on a sequence of bases. So, so if we try to model it from a more communications perspective, we see that there are a lot of bad things going on here. So there is a lot of memory, something called intersymbol interference, because a lot of sequences contribute to each sample here. Uh, sometimes the base is skipped. Sometimes the speed of the DNA going through the pore is not constant. So that means there is a lot of synchronization related issue. And finally, as expected, there is some noise. So it makes it really, really hard to model and analyze properly. And therefore, what we do is we combine the strengths of machine learning, which allows us to model this very well, with the strengths of coding theory, which once you have a model, then it allows us to build very good error correction codes. Right. So, so let's look at the key idea. So, so we have the raw signal and we usually pass it through the base caller. And the base caller usually consists of two stages. So the first stage is a sequence of neural, uh, neural network layers which generate some sort of probabilities. These are some sort of transition probabilities that distill the information in the raw signal into a much simpler form. And what people would usually do is you just do the base calling, get the sequence of bases. But unfortunately, the base calling does not use the constraints that are provided by the error correction code, right? So here it's important to understand that the, the DNA we uh, synthesize is not just any sequence of DNA. It is a code word for our code. So 
and a lot of times since we are not using the code constraint this this is wrong and has a lot of errors but what if we use this these probabilities for the decoding and we use the code constraints during the decoding maybe we can do much much better so so that is the core idea so let's look at it in more detail now so as i said before we we focus on the inner code here and we use something called the convolutional code which consists of a sh shift register and as the input data goes through the register the output is generated using a linear combination of the current state and this binary data is then converted into dna using a simple uh, two bit per base modulation scheme uh, and as you can see the sequential structure really matches well with the structure of the nanopore sequencing itself and that actually is the main reason we use this convolutional codes um, right so there are two parameters here one is that every incoming bit leads to two output bits so the rate is half and the memory is the number of uh, number of bits in the state which is six here uh, and we can also represent the, this as a state diagram which just shows you uh, that from a given state there are two possible output uh, next states and for every input you get like two output bits so so what do we do we here we, what we do is that we have the convolutional code state diagram and we have a state diagram that is given to us by the base caller itself so it says like okay what is the probability from going to a to a a to c a to g a to t and these are basically the scores these are based on the neural network uh, so the, the these are actually dependent on the raw signal itself and we can combine these two state diagrams to give us a joint state diagram so so usually when you want to decode a convolutional code you would decode over this uh, this state diagram uh, using some parameters given to you from the channel so here these channel parameters are basically replaced by this neural network model so that is the more uh, basic idea and i would suggest you to uh, uh, recommend that you you can look at the paper for understanding this in much more detail uh, right so so with that the overall inner code looks something like this so we start with the segment we add the index we add some sort of uh, checksum like a crc then we do the convolutional coding and map it to dna and then when we are reading it back back we do something called convolutional list decoding so instead of getting just one sequence we get a bunch of candidate sequences and then we check the checksum on each of them and we choose the one where the checksum matches and then we can use that for the outer code decoding the read, uh, the outer code recording right so so let's look at some experiments and results so so for our experiment we took a relatively small amount of data uh, because the idea here is to showcase our uh, idea rather than get a fully scalable system uh, and which included a, a bunch of texts including some of the famous speeches as well as some poems and so on uh, we use the reed solomon code as the outer code which is very similar to some of the previous works uh, with 30 percent redundancy and we use the flappy base color from nanopore which which has a, a retrained neural network model then we synthesize the data using custom array with length around 165 and we, we experiment with a number of convolutional code rates different memories different list sizes so the rate half the, the higher rate convolutional codes are generated using puncturing uh, and i won't go into the details here but uh, you, you can take a look at the paper right so so let's look at the results so so as we saw before these are the two previous works and we see that like for the appropriate choice of parameters you can get three times better reading cost at the same writing cost uh, if you use a high enough rate convolutional code and we see that as we use a higher rate higher m convolutional code so the higher state uh, state we see that the results generally improve quite a bit so this is m equal to 8 this is m equal to 11 uh, and but this comes at a cost of uh, higher decoding complexity which is exponential in the memory right so so with that let's look at the summary so we have presented a novel error correction mechanism for nanopore sequencing based dna storage the three key ideas are first of all it is that we use soft information from the raw signal to improve the decoding rather than relying on just the base call sequence we we use the raw signal uh, the information from the raw signal which is much richer uh, but since modeling the raw signal is very hard we use the neural network in the base caller to distill this information uh, into a more usable form right and finally we use convolutional codes that align very very nicely with the sequential nanopore model so in the results we saw that this requires three times fewer reads for decoding as compared to previous works for future work we uh, we will look at optimization of convolutional codes and uh, uh, crc parameters uh, the second point we are already looking at right now which is the fine tuning of the neural network model and can so basically whenever you have a new base caller which is which does better base calling you can use it to improve our decoder as well 
And finally, we want to apply this to other synthesis methodologies uh, because the general idea is very, very, uh, very, very applicable to a lot of different synthesis methods, including something called enzymatic synthesis, which is uh, which people are very interested in nowadays. So, with that, I would like to thank thank you all, and uh, you can access the code and data uh, on GitHub. Um, and yeah, thanks for attending my talk. Uh,